Behind the Icon, a dramatic series on the life of Marilyn Monroe. Our story continues with Episode 4, My Life Was Grim, Part 1. Thank you for arranging for me to see the house privately, Mr. Burke. Oh, absolutely. The pleasure is all mine, Miss Monroe. Given your status, I would imagine it's challenging to buy a home. Sellers and their neighbors recognize it. Well, they feel my fame gives them the privilege to say anything to me. Anything. And that it won't hurt my feelings. Like, it's happening to my clothing. I get, you know, who does she think she is? Marilyn Monroe? <laughs> but I'm really very sensitive. I stopped to view uh, another property for sale a few weeks ago, and a man came out and greeted me warmly and cheerfully, and... He said, uh, I, I want my wife to meet you. Well, uh, when she came out and recognized me, she said, Will you please get off my property? I'm sorry to hear that. You'll find the property I'm showing you today affords really good privacy. My psychiatrist is hoping the house will ground and center me. Uh, like take the place of a husband or a baby. And it will protect me. I've lived a nomadic life since my childhood. I'm ready for a change. Sounds like you are ready to put down some roots. Well, I could never imagine buying a home alone, but I've always been alone, so why couldn't I imagine it? So like you requested, it's an authentic Spanish colonial hacienda. It was built in 1929 by a motion picture accountant. I like it's not a movie star's home. Uh, thank you for helping to find an authentic hacienda similar to my psychiatrist's home. I want it to look as much like his as possible. And Brentwood is a lovely, upscale neighborhood. It's not ostentatious like Beverly Hills or Malibu. Well, that's good. Uh, I just need a small home for when I'm on the West Coast making pictures. It's less depressing than living in a hotel or in the little patio apartment where I've been since August. So the property today is in this section between Sunset to the north and San Vicente to the south. Right now we're turning onto Carmelina. The house is on one of the numbered Helenas off Carmelina. Numbered Helenas? <laughs> yes, the locals refer to the streets off Carmelina as the numbered Helenas. Oh, uh, so all the streets are named Helena? Yes, the house I'm taking you to is on the 5th Helena Drive. There are only two homes on the cul-de-sac, aside from the two on the corner of Carmelina. Hmm. Ah, here it is, on the left, just beyond this whitewashed brick wall. It looks like a little fortress where I can feel safe from the world. I, I can see the red barrel tiled roof. <laughs> yeah, let me just get the gates open. Oh, I love this fuchsia bougainvillea climbing the wall. It's a wall of color. Here it is. How charming. Oh, it's like a doll's house. To the left is the garage and an attached guest house. Garage. Uh, well, I don't own a car anymore. I, I gave mine away to my acting coach a son in New York. But I, I like the idea of the guest house. I can imagine adding a second story over the garage and the guest house. If I add that apartment, I can coax Hattie, my cook in New York, to come and live with me here. And, uh, the guest house will be perfect for me to entertain my acting coach and his wife and, uh, Carl Sandberg when they come to visit me. There's a courtyard there that connects the garage and the guest house to the main house over there. And the neighbors are quiet. 
and the lot is gorgeous. It's actually an acre of rolling lawn with a sloping rear view overlooking the valley below. My housekeeper said uh, she heard the sounds of children playing when she viewed this house last week. Ah, uh, yes, the pagans. The couple who is selling has outgrown it. Uh, built in 1929, Mr. Burke? That is correct. It's almost as old as I am. <laughs> I, I like that it's been lived in by several generations. All right, well, let's go inside. It's a three-bedroom, two-bath home, with fireplaces in the living room and the master bedroom. Oh, uh, what's this on the doorstep? Ah, it's a grouping of hand-painted tiles of a coat of arms. Well, it says something. Yes, it does. Cursum perficio. Latin? Yes, it translates to, my journey ends here. Sounds prophetic. After you, Miss Monroe. I love the beamed cathedral ceilings, and the arches, and the stucco walls. And notice the windows on the front of the house. They have deep sills and ornamental iron grating that also provides added security. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just taking it all in. Yes, Miss Monroe. I see you studying and memorizing every detail. Here is a sunroom or den. It opens to the kidney-shaped pool. I think it's beautiful. That heater is rather unsightly, but you can remove that. Ah, uh, over here is the dining room. And the kitchen's here. It was modernized about 10 years ago. Now this kitchen needs to be completely renovated back to the Spanish colonial motif of the house. I see uh, brightly colored tiles from Mexico, like, like my psychiatrist's kitchen. I spend a lot of time in the kitchen with his wife and his children. On the other side of the living room is the master with an in-suite bath and Kiva fireplace. And two bedrooms connected by a Jack and Jill bath. I love the simplicity. Well, Miss Monroe, would you like to make an offer? Well, it's small, but I find it rather cozy and quiet and peaceful. Uh, I'd like to bring Mr. DiMaggio to view it again with me and see what he thinks, but I like it. Whenever it's convenient for you and Mr. DiMaggio. Mr. Burke, that inscription on the doorstep, I hope it's true. Well, I can picture myself living here alone with my snowball, my little white Maltese. <laughs> y you know, I, I do have that feeling, Mr. Burke, that it's mine. Like, it belongs to me, and, and I belong to it in return. Why, maybe someday there may even be children here. They'll have a home, a real home. I can give them something I never had as a child, something my mother couldn't give me. Feels a little funny to say that, but well, here I am. Cursum perficio. Why, it's perfect. I didn't like the world around me too much because it was kind of grim. You see, I was brought up differently from the average American child. Well, the average American child is expected to be happy, but happiness wasn't anything I ever took for granted. I was brought up a waif I knew I was different from the other children because there was no kisses or promises in life. I often felt lonely 
and wanted to die. I tried to cheer myself up with daydreams. I never dreamt of anyone loving me as I saw other children loved. But that was too big of a stretch for my imagination. Marilyn's lifelong obsessive ambition to become a mother and actress was deeply rooted in childhood and was shaped by the women who participated in her upbringing. She managed to survive a horrifying childhood while preserving the radiant spirit her public persona later projected. The warm climate of Los Angeles lured the fledgling film industry from the East Coast as early as 1907. The major studios include Biograph Film Company, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, United Artists, Vitagraph, Warner Brothers, Columbia, Fox Films, and famous players Lasky, later renamed Paramount Studios. By 1923, more than one-fifth of the population of Los Angeles worked in the motion picture industry. How I moan and how I fight those big city blues I walk for miles, place to place But no one smiles to help me chase those big city blues That year, Marilyn's mother, Gladys Baker, returned to Los Angeles and was greeted by an enormous sign rising from the slopes of Mount Lee towering over the Hollywood Hills. A housing developer had recently erected 13 50-foot-tall letters spelling out Hollywood land as a promotional signage for his real estate enterprise. Gladys found employment in Hollywood as a splicer or negative cutter at Consolidated Film Industries. The company developed and printed film for the studio directors to view the dailies for possible inclusion in the final version of a film. Mostly female employees worked in the film laboratories as precision cutters. The work was long and monotonous, usually six days per week. Gladys's co-worker was Grace Atchison McKee. Grace had the reputation of being hard-working, hard-drinking, and moving from one romantic relationship to another. She longed for a career in pictures, but settled for a position behind instead of in front of the cameras. Grace later became a significant figure in Marilyn's childhood and introduced her to motion pictures and film actors. Oh, another day, another dollar. Well, I'll say, in another 10 hours we'll be back here again. I think I'm going home to soak my arms or something. Oh, I know what you mean. I sure wish I worked in front of the cameras instead of behind. I'd like to be Mary Pickford. Well, you're tiny like Mary Pickford. I'm five feet one. But I sure ain't married to Douglas Fairbanks. And I sure ain't living at Pickfair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not Mae Murray, and I'm not married to Rudolph Valentino. I'm Grace McKee. Nice to meet you. I'm Gladys Monroe Baker. So, are you hitched? Well, I was married to a mechanic for Shell Oil. We lived in Sautel, but he turned out to be a flat tire, so I just left him. Then I married a draftsman, Mr. McKee. Well, I thought he was the cat's meow at first, you know, all hotsy totsy. Then just another letdown. So I said, goodbye, Charlie. Guess I'm just crazy about the fellas. How about you? I lived in Kentucky for a spell. My husband, Jasper, left me. He was a jealous man. You got kids, honey? Yes, a girl and a boy. But my husband took my children. My daughter and son live in Kentucky with him and his new wife. Ah, oh, shucks. That's awful. 
What a fink. You must be really heartbroken. I do miss them just the same. They'll be cared for. But there is nothing I can do about it right now. Now I'm just trying to make it here in Hollywood on my own. Well, I like being an independent woman. When I want someone or something, I pounce on it. But most of all, I'm very busy doing nothing. Going to parties and boozing are one of the most important things in my life. And this job allows me to do it. Hey, you should come out with me tonight to the speakeasy. What'd you say? Oh, I don't know. Ah, oh, come on. Don't be such a wet blanket. You're so pretty. I wish I was as pretty as you. Let's go and have some fun before we have to punch that clock again in the morning. Let's live a little. Be like flappers tonight. Maybe we'll even meet some sheiks and dance the foxtrot and the toddle. You game? I suppose. Where is the speakeasy? Well, it's a little place I know. It's called the Tam O'Shanter Inn. Oh, they serve the best white lightning. White lightning? Bathtub gin, honey. I can't believe this is the third night in a row that we've gone out together. You're a real live wire, Grace. I'm so glad we're friends. And I'm so glad you dyed your hair red like I told you. You look like the bee's knees. You are pretty. It sure is bright. It's bright and liberated, <laughs> just like you. Hey, I was thinking, we should rent a place together in Silver Lake. That sounds swell. We could share expenses and finally get ahead. Until we find husbands. <laughs> <laughs> In the meanwhile, I think you need a man, Gladys. A man to have some fun with. I know I sure need one. I just want a man who loves me. Hi, ladies. Well, how do you do? Hello, fellas. Oh, you ladies look like movie stars. Why, thank you. Well, we do work in pictures. Say, you work in the pictures? We most certainly do. So who are you, Gloria Swanson and Marion Davies? No, we don't work in front of the cameras. We work behind the cameras. Far behind. <laughs> <laughs> How far? Pasadena? Oh, stop. <laughs> no, really, what do you ladies do? We're film negative cutters. Precision film cutters. Well, that sounds interesting. Oh, it's long and monotonous work. Oh, I'll say, six days a week, we put on our white gloves, we splice the film marked by the editor, we pass it on to another team of white glove women who glue the pieces of negatives together into a montage. A montage? What you see on the screen, silly. Say, can we, uh, join you ladies? Be our guests. Take a seat. I'm Grace. And this here is my new best friend, Gladys. Well, nice to meet you, miss. You're real pretty. Why, thank you. Waiter, bring us a round of old fashions. Oh, and I'll take another Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Gladys, I think you might have found a fella to love you. Slow down on drinking. We've got to work tomorrow morning. Gladys and Grace could be considered flappers of their era, known as the Jazz Age. They drank bootleg liquor, took unchaperoned weekend trips with their bows to the mountains, and fraternized with men at beach parties. Flappers challenged the social and sexual norms for women established by the preceding Victorian and Edwardian periods. They wore cosmetics and short skirts, exposing the knees, and engaged in casual sex outside of marriage. These changes illustrated the beginnings of women's political and social transformations in the Roaring Twenties. Gladys dated or engaged in relationships with a series of male co-workers. Then she and Grace shared an apartment in the Silver Lake section of Los Angeles. Grace soon observed the emerging symptoms of what would eventually develop into a severe and persistent mental illness for Gladys. I'm home! Gladys! I'm home! Where are you? 
<laughs> Over here. Where, honey? <gasps> Behind the sofa. Gladys, what are you doing down there? Sweetie, what's wrong? There's a group of men sneaking around the apartment. Honey, there's no men in this apartment. Heaven knows there's been men here, but there ain't no men in this apartment now. But I found a man lying in the kitchen cupboard. And I saw another man come into my bedroom. But he disappeared. Disappeared? Gladys, come up here with me. Are you okay? Sweetie, you're shaking. I'm so afraid. Oh, I I I'll take you around the apartment and show you. See, honey? There's no men here. I heard voices. I was frightened. Just frightened. Oh, there, there. You're safe. It was so real. I'm so glad you're here now, Grace. I was so afraid. Oh, I'm here, honey. Everything's gonna be okay now. You're all right. I'm here. I'll watch out for you, and you'll watch out for me. We'll take care of each other. That's right, honey. We will. Oh, my good gracious Gladys. Coaxed by grace, Gladys dated many men, but in truth, wanted a husband to love her. Enter Martin Edward Mortensen, a meter man for the Southern California Gas Company. Mortensen was divorced, age 27, and a devout Lutheran who enjoyed motorcycles. His religious convictions meshed with Gladys's newfound spiritual preoccupation, demonstrated by her attendance at Christian Science Services. The couple married on October 11, 1924, at the home of a Presbyterian minister in North Hollywood. Della, Gladys's mother, had a history of unstable relationships and marriages. This provided a poor example for Gladys. Consequently, Gladys left Mortensen only four months after their marriage to live with Grace. Mortensen filed for divorce in May 1925, claiming his wife willfully and without cause deserted him. For the next 10 months, Gladys continued to date a number of male co-workers at Consolidated Film Laboratories. One of those men, Charles Stanley Gifford, worked as a foreman on the day shift. Gifford was separated from his wife Lillian and reputed to be a wild philanderer, according to his wife's divorce complaint. Gifford may also have briefly dated Gladys in 1923, before her marriage to Mortensen. Everything that's been said about my father or my father's is wrong. My mother's uh, first husband was named Baker. Her second husband was Mortensen. However, she'd been divorced from both of them by the time I was born. It's true that I was illegitimate. Throughout her life, Gladys consistently insisted that Gifford was the father of her third child, and the timing of their relationship supports this claim. She left Mortensen 20 days after a judge finalized Gifford's divorce on May 6th and co-workers acknowledged the affair during the spring of 1925. Then, later that same year, Gladys learned she was pregnant again. When she announced the pregnancy to Gifford during the second trimester on New Year's Day 1926, he denied paternity and cited her concurrent sexual involvement with several other men. Gladys's extreme sexuality may have been a symptom of a psychiatric mood disorder. Her mood fluctuated rapidly with dramatic polarity. She changed suddenly from being joyful to irritable, angry, even hostile. At times Gladys seemed manic like her mother. She was restless, talked rapidly and incessantly, displayed poor judgment, had little need for sleep, and experienced racing thoughts. During her manic episodes, Gladys engaged in reckless behavior such as seeking out numerous sexual liaisons. Other times, she experienced episodes of depression, 
marked by crying spells, fatigue, poor concentration, lethargy, and a loss of feelings of pleasure. Gladys would also experience auditory hallucinations of voices, as well as visual hallucinations. Eventually, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. It's possible, however, that during this period, Gladys was suffering from schizoaffective disorder, with symptoms of both disturbed mood and psychosis. Gladys, now pregnant again and unmarried, turned to her mother Della for comfort and advice. I'm expecting again, Mama. (laughs) Sorry, honey, I won't be able to help you. Shell Oil is sending my Charles to Borneo. Where's that? It sounds far away. It's an island in Southeast Asia, and I'm going with him. You'll have to look after yourself, Gladys. Oh, Grace, what am I going to do? This baby couldn't have come at a worse time. I can't go through with this. I was careless. Oh, so careless. And you encouraged me. You've got to help me. Don't drag me into your mistake, Gladys. That's unfair, and I won't be blamed. You knew what you were doing. Sure, it's a shame your mother's skipping out, but she has her own life to lead. I will help you any way I can. Then help me find one of those doctors. The kind that takes care of it. You know what I mean. Gladys, you're mixed up. That's your illness talking. What you're really afraid of is you don't know how you're going to raise your baby without a husband or help from your mother. I don't care about raising it. I can't and I won't. I don't want it. Well, if you don't want it, we can put the baby up for adoption. No! I said I don't want it! I don't want to have it at all! My God! Do you realize what you're saying? You said you would help me. I... I... I want you to help me find a doctor. Good Lord, Gladys! I will not help you do such a thing. I may be a hooch-drinking, carousing woman, done a few men wrong, other things I'm ashamed of, but there is one thing I won't do. I won't help you kill your child. No! I don't care! I'm not going to change my mind. I said I don't want it! Get a hold of yourself, Gladys. This child has come into your life for a reason. You've lost two children already. This one that's coming is God's gift to you. Can't you see that? Oh! No, no, I said! I'm going to get rid of this baby. I don't want it! You try that and I will stop you. God help you, you poor, sick woman. The two women braved through the experience of Gladys' pregnancy together remaining friends through the spring of 1926. Grace cared for Gladys and both saved a little money preparing for the baby's birth. As summer approached, it was time for the baby to come into the world. For the facts behind the scenes portrayed in this episode, be sure to listen to our companion podcast, Norma Jean, Discovering Truths, a discussion around the historical events drawn from Marilyn's life, which we are using to create the dramatic narrative in every episode. For the complete experience of our series, visit our website at marilynbehindtheicon.com where you can listen to every episode and also follow the story through historical photographs, videos, and exclusive anecdotes. 
You can subscribe on the website to join our community and get special updates about the series. On Facebook, search Maryland Behind the Icon and stay connected to our social posts. Subscribe to the audio series of Maryland Behind the Icon on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or where you're listening now. We'd love for you to give us a review or rating if you're enjoying what you're hearing. You can also support the show and the production by checking out the offers from the advertisers and sponsors you hear in the show or find on our website. This dramatic audio series is based on the two-volume biography by author Gary Vitaco Robles titled Icon, The Life, Times, and Films of Marilyn Monroe.